Emigration has always been a big part of our nation's story. For generations, Irish people have left to set up new lives and make their mark all over the world. So much so that there are about 70 million people with Irish roots scattered across the globe. And in 2013, it's up to all of us to invite friends and relatives home for a nationwide celebration of who we are and what we stand for. It's a chance to reunite, to bring us together. It's called The Gathering. In this series, six of our best-known immigrants are returning to their roots to do what they can to bring the diaspora back to their home place. They'll reunite with some familiar faces, help bring old friends back together, and send a message to the world asking them to come home. Tonight, Gaelic football and Aussie rules star Ty Kennelly is returning to his hometown of Listowel, where he'll discover the hidden history of the town. I remember the old man, a little tear going down his eye. That's an overwhelming small bit. He'll do what he does best. The fitness is really good at the moment, so this, you know, I'm really elevated myself to another level, so I have by doing nothing for a year. And he'll launch a tribute to his home place to encourage Kerry people everywhere to make their way back to the kingdom. I came back thinking it was about promoting Ireland and the stall and getting people back, but it's actually me, you know, I'm, I'm the gathering. The Stoll in North Kerry is famed for its annual racing festival and is renowned as a literary hub thanks to its Writers' Week and local heroes Brian McMahon and John B. Keane. Another of Listowel's favourite sons is Ty Canelli. Having starred for the Kerry footballers at underage level, Ty was drafted by the Sydney Swans Aussie Rules team in 1999 and made the big move down under at the tender age of 18. Recently retired from playing, he still lives in the Coogee Bay area of the city with his fiancée Nicole and their dog, Molly. It's a difficult thing when you're, when you're away from home and it's nice to have people, I suppose, from where you come from, when you're the other side of the world, in another country. And I'm no different. You're home soon, aren't I, man? Yeah, I'm going home the 6th. Can't wait. We've got a little community here and we watch Kerry games and we watch our soccer games and watch the Olympics for Ireland, what's going on, and, and all, it's just great. In 2006, Tighe became the first Irishman to win the Australian Premiership and soon set his sights on completing a unique double, which culminated in an emotional and heroic homecoming in 2009. I grew up idolising my father and I grew up idolising Kerry footballers and wanting to win an all Ireland medal. And then when my father passed away, it was in 2005, it was a very difficult time for me here in Australia. The whole year of, of coming back to Ireland was, was enormous and I went back for one reason, to win an Ireland medal and I'm delighted to say that, that I got it. The emotion was unbelievable. That's what was driving me to win an Ireland Ireland was, was, was I suppose, the emotion of losing my father and, and growing up watching my father do it. And now Taig is going home again, a long journey from the other side of the world that he's always happy to make. When I get over that bridge in the stall and get home, it's almost like there's been a weight lifted off my shoulders. It's, uh, I just feel so at ease. When you're away from home, you're very, very patriotic of where you come from. And, and I'm not different to anyone else, you know. I become very patriotic about Ireland. Get the ball off me. You're going to get the ball off me. Yeah. The stall has always been on my mind. Growing up, you know, I always thought I'd never leave the town. I'd never leave the place. I always thought I was very much a home bird, you know. Timmy, with you? Oh! Go on, Timmy. Go on, Timmy. Go on, for Timmy. After taking a sound beating from his nephew in the football, Tyg heads downtown to see what the locals are doing to bring people back to Listowel. And his first stop is Stax Furniture Shop, which the owner Damien also uses as the global headquarters for the Stack clan. Tyg, how are things? How are things? Fine. Welcome home. How are you keeping? Nice to see you. Good to see you. We're having the Stack clan gathering. Oh, wow. And I've met over the years lots of stacks and yeah, yeah. from the 70s they've been coming in. You'd often see Americans outside the door taking photographs. Yeah. This would be Jack Rillahan. His uh, ancestors came from North Kerry. They were stacks and uh, they have nearly a thousand of the family in Kansas from that family of stacks. Then we have the new generation of immigrants, unfortunately. Yeah. Oh, this is my daughter yeah. Amy, you know yeah, Amy. Yeah. And this guy then is Ed Stack. Yeah. And his grandfather came from the store. Now, you all look the same. There might be some sort of a gene mm connecting us somewhere <laughs> along the line, but that was taken in Colorado. Yeah. <laughs> Some kind. Yeah. So you're trying to get these back home next year? Or? We're trying to get everyone back home. I have 250 friends on Facebook for the Stack clan gathering. Damien's using his fixation with his own family tree to help others find out where they came from. 
He and his friend, Ger Graney, from the North Kerry Reaching Out group, will help anyone with roots in the area trace their ancestry. And today, there's a surprise in store for Tyg. Tyg, seeing as we're having the stack can gathering in July of next year, oh, I joke. wanted to see how you stack lineage. <laughs> so here's your family tree, the ancestors of Tyg Kennelly, starting with you and your late father. <laughs> yeah. And then Michael Kennelly, yep. and then there's Timothy. So your yeah. great great grandmother was Elizabeth Stack. Darling, yes, well, thank you can you. go back to 1750. <laughs> oh, wow. And even better again, Tyg, you're actually related to me through marriage. <laughs> <laughs> Are you taking? No, me? no. Your grand uncle Morris, his daughter Josephine, yep. married John Grork, yep. had a son Tom, yep. and Tom was married to my niece. <laughs> so like, Everybody's yes. connected. She's my niece. Listen, there we go. Cousin. <laughs> Cousin. <laughs> oh wow, so this is brilliant. This is very powerful stuff. I, I came back, you know, thinking it was about promoting Ireland and the stall and getting people back, but it's it's actually me, you know, I'm I'm the gathering. The nice thing as well is if you go back to the 1820s, it's written down there as Timothy, but he actually went as Tyg. He's Tyg Kennelly on the church. Look at there, look. This is unbelievable. I love this. You know, going back to the 1820s, there was a Tyg Kennelly in the stall. <laughs> I'm the one looking up my family three, and I'm the one that wants to come back and should be coming back in 2013. And there's your official invitation to the Stack Clan gathering for next year. I'll be there. Oh, sure. I'm related to the Stacks now as well, so <laughs> I, I mean... Listen, you're I not mean. related to the Stacks, you are a Stack. I am a Stack. <laughs> <laughs> discovered a little more about where he comes from, Ty goes back to where he grew up, to the site of the old family pub on William Street. Very different now what actual front of it is, you know, even trying to look in and see what's what's inside, it's it's, uh, it's quite different as well, you know. This is where our Crow Park, uh, myself and my brother's Crow Park was here, we, uh, this is no wall here, it was just flat, flat wall and we uh, kicked so many points off that wall, it was unbelievable, flat out every day, morning, noon and night. You'd end up sometimes with 10, 15 young fellas just kicking the ball off a wall. It was fantastic and it does bring back a lot of memories, so it does actually. Uh, I feel like I need to get a ball in my hand and start, start kicking it off the wall, you know. My bedroom was actually up there at the top of the house and uh, had a great view, so good times. While he's on William Street, Tyg drops by his old friend and neighbour, Vincent Carmody. Hey, Tyg. How are you? How are you? Okay, good. good to see you. How are things? How are things? The foremost authority on the history of Listole, Vincent is keen to tell Tyg about some of his fellow migrants from around the town, starting with a woman who lived just a few doors down from him. There's a lady born three doors up by the name of Cathy Buckley. Mm -hmm. And do you know what she became? The head cook in the White House. Oh, God. Will we go into her house? <laughs> Kathy Buckley was working as a chef in the Butler Arms Hotel in Waterville, where the renowned banker J.P. Morgan was so impressed with her fare that he took her to work in his house in Connecticut. There, one high-powered dinner party would lead to Kathy moving house again, this time to Washington, D.C. One time there was a, an American uh, president, an incumbent president, eating there. And he liked the food so much, he said, uh, who's the cook? And so Cathy was introduced and he said, will you come to the White House? Oh, wow. So that was uh, Calvin Coleridge and she was there for Her Herbert Hoover and she was there, he was, or she was there for uh, Franklin Roosevelt. Oh, my God. Three presidents. But she came back to the stall. After that? Uh, in the 60s. She died here in the 60s, oh, wow. Oh, wow. above in the Kennedy Nussel home. Oh, wow. This is a photograph of Cathy taken outside the White House. And tell the servants how fit, you know what I mean, the chef, the cook. Yeah, Great right. picture, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, this is our nationalisation papers in 1916. It's hilarious. I walk past the store so many times in my life and, and don't know any part of the history until right yeah. now. Now that he knows a little more about the neighbours, Tyg is about to find out about another story of the Stoll emigrants, a family saga that has only recently come to light with the discovery of a trunk full of letters in an attic in New York. How are we here, Vinnie? I'm taking you back now to the 1890s, and a family came back from Boston called the Glaciers. Yeah. And the eldest boy decided to go back to, to America. Right. right. Now, all the letters that were sent from here over to the brother... Yeah, of course. They turned up out of the blue. Oh. Uh, some boy called um, Ben Naylor. Yeah, right. His, himself and his wife, they were left some stuff. Somebody had died, and there was a trunk and inside in the trunk were there's hundreds of letters and they are known, they are gone now in history and they are on the internet known as the Glacier Letters. To 
To dig deeper into the story of the Glacier family and their letters, Ty pays a visit to Mary Cogan. Mary writes the Listole Connection blog, where she regularly hears from people with ties to the town from all around the world. Good to see you. You're welcome. The most unusual email that I got was from a man called Ben Naylor. His grandfather, Frank, had kept every letter that was sent to him from Listole. Ben Naylor and his wife, Kathleen, have been diligently posting the letters online since they discovered them six months ago and are about 10 years into 60 years' worth of correspondence. The family originally, George and his wife, came from Listole. They settled in Massachusetts and they had five children. Uh, then George's wife died and he decided to come back to Listone. Shortly after coming home, the eldest Frank went back again. And Frank is Ben Naylor's grandfather. Wow. Many of the early letters are from Frank's brother Joseph, who is desperate to join him in the States. This is Joseph now in Listone writing to his brother Frank in Massachusetts. He's only about 16 or 17 at this stage, so he wow. can't go really until he's uh, a bit older. I was more than surprised when you told, told Father you wouldn't take me out until next spring. Send for me next month, if you possibly can, and you will not be sorry. In 1907, Joseph joined Frank, as detailed in a letter from their younger sister, Annie. We were glad to hear that you've landed safely. We thought you would have a rough voyage for the week. You sailed was frightfully stormy and rainy. You must be delighted to be out of this hole anyway. <laughs> I know I would. They all want to go, they're all jealous of the other front of her. In December 1907, Frank and Joseph's father, George, sent a letter wishing his two sons a happy Christmas. Dear Frank, I'm taking the opportunity of writing you a few lines for the last time this year, I expect. Obviously, December 9th. So wishing you both a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. We're all well at home at present. Hoping you both are also. But the next letter that was sent from the stole tells of a tragic turn in the Glacier family saga. Dear Frank, that was frightful news you sent us this time, but you only done your duty, my poor Joe. Can I realise that you are not to be seen anymore on earth? His boyish movements haunts my mind. When he was a little boy, I break down when I think of him and his look of affection towards me. Oh, that's very sad. It is awful sad. Less than a year after joining Frank in the States, Joseph was killed instantly in an accident on the railroad. There was something up with myself since a week before Christmas. Well, I could not sleep, only thinking until near morning, then I would sleep. But should get up, I thought. It was the worry of business at Christmas. But I found out now, to my great sorrow, that's unreal. Yeah. That sense, I suppose, of knowing something's wrong or something's yeah, happened. Yeah, yeah. A similar experience happened myself when the father passed away. We, we, the fire alarm went off in the house about two hours before I got the phone call. I just knew something was wrong. That is unbelievable, yeah. powerful stuff. It resonates so much with myself with everything that happened with his son Joe and his brother Frank being the other side of the world and wanting to get out of the place and live the dream. And, and, and like I said, you know, you can see how hard it was for, for the father Frank to deal with uh, the death of his son. They're fantastic. Thank you, Mary. That's, that's an overwhelming a small bit, you know what I mean? Tonight, Ty Canelli has returned from Australia to his hometown of Listowel. There are reunions and revelations for this famous son of the kingdom as he gains a deeper understanding of his heritage in his mission to invite the Irish across the globe to find their way home. For many of us, the late John B. Keane is the first person that comes to mind when you think of Listowel. And for Tig, no visit home is complete without dropping into the great man's pub to catch up with his old friend, John B.'s son, Billy. Hey, uh, Billy boy. Jeez, how's it going? How are you keeping? Come on, give me a hug. Give me a hug. We've got a, a great connection with the, the Keynes and Canellis have. Uh, my father was all about the community, and Billy's father, John, obviously, was all about Listowel and, and talking about Listowel and, and couldn't stop promoting Listowel. You've seen many people leave Listowel, haven't you? Oh, man. For my class in, in national school, I'd say there's about three of us left. Not all of them have gone as far away as you did, you know. <laughs> but uh, they're, they're gone all over the world. I actually remember. When I played my first few games with the stall, and uh, I'd meet your father, and he used to give me 20 pounds. I was a professional <laughs> at 15 with your father. I remember the first time you were going away, and you came down to say goodbye to the old man and myself, and you were going off on a deadly adventure, and you just walked out the door, and you were all laughs, and you were on top of the world. I remember the old man, a little tear going down his eye. He knew because he had to go himself, you know, he yeah, left yeah, in the yeah, 50s, yeah. he was gone for four years, five years. He, yeah, he knew that it wasn't coming. just going to be a jaunt yeah, yeah. for you, because no one had the heart yeah, to tell you. Yeah. Billy's always been one to, to help me out and has always watched over me. 
board was lost off orders as well. I know my father did pass. He was probably the first person to actually ring me straight after my brother. I think you should come back for one more year. Right, let's stall limits. No problem. Stall limits. Yeah. Let's stall, uh, till the stall limits. Hey, hold on. Another toast to, to yourself and your lovely bride, Nicole, and to John B. and the horse. Yeah, stay job. Lovely deal. I'll drink to that one. Slante. The session in John B.'s goes on well into the night, giving Kai another chance to showcase his famous Irish dancing moves. The dance moves might be a bit rusty, but the next day, Tighe's really under pressure to show he's still got it as he pulls on the jersey of his beloved Listowel Emmets for his first game of Gaelic football since the triumphant All-Ireland Final in 2009. Playing with blokes that you grew up with, you know, I haven't seen many of them in, in a long time and something I certainly miss still. Right, 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 right. Just because you live on the other side of the world doesn't mean you don't have a responsibility to where you come from and, and where you grew up. Such a great, great country, and I think it takes until you leave it to understand how good a place we are in. Yeah, it's great. The fitness is, is really good at the moment, so this, you know, I'm really elevated myself to another level, so I have by doing nothing for a year, and eating all those chips and spuds and mash and peas and potatoes and chocolate. It's really, I recommend it to anyone, like, because it's the, it's the diet of champions. You appreciate things a lot more when you come home. You appreciate your town and, and the people in the area that you grew up a lot, lot more when you're away from it for so long. I said, look, I wasn't good enough. You've had your chance, boy. Hang up the boots. They're gone. That's it. Uh, I'll have to walk away into the sunset now. Earlier, Ty heard the story of the Glacier Letters, an epic local history told in a series of recently discovered letters sent from a Listowel family to their son and brother, Frank, in America. Ben Naylor, a descendant of the Glaciers from New York, found the letters in his uncle's attic and has been posting them online for the past six months. Eager to help Ben connect with some real-life relatives, Ty has asked his friends in Listowel to find any living descendants of the Glaciers. There's a person, Giles, uh, from uh, Tralee, and his descendants are from the glaciers that moved to America and that fantastic story. So, look, it's, it's only relevant that we catch all the Giles and, and bring them to the stall and uh, introduce them to the information that we found. How are you getting there? Giles, how are nice you? Nice to meet you, Tyke. Oh, God, have we got some information for you. Giles has no idea that more than 60 years of his family's story has been hidden in a loft on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. So it's time for Tyke to introduce Giles to the glacier letters. My poor Joe, can I realise that you are not to be seen anymore? And to get a letter like this, you know, must have been absolutely heartbreaking, heartbreaking yeah. for him, wouldn't yeah. it? It's crazy how it, oh, you wouldn't hear about this at all, Joe. But I suppose it was so long ago. Like I didn't even know I had that many ancestors, Joe. That there were so many brothers there, and yeah, yeah. it's quite a, it's yeah, quite it's, a story. Oh, it's crazy. Yeah. We were lucky, cousin of yours, Ben was was able to find the the letters. Yeah. Did you know you had a cousin? No. Well, uh, we got Ben on Skype. Oh, uh, perfect. And yeah. he actually doesn't know that, that you're here. I don't he's got any relatives oh, here. Oh, really? Hello, Ben. Hi, good to meet you. We've got a, a bit of a surprise for you. This is a relative of yours. All oh, right. A wow. cousin, wow. cousin of yours, Giles. So Very nice to meet you. Very nice how, to meet you. Uh, you know how we're related? Um, cousins. My no, granny good. is uh, Mildred Boyle, and she married George. And they were living in um, Bally Bunyan. They have a guest house there they had it for years. I know my, my parents went over to, to, to Listol on their honeymoon. That was about 30 years ago. Oh, okay. um, and they, they ran across a relative of theirs named, uh, I think it was George's son, Boise. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Boise, yeah. That'd be my granddad. Yeah. Right. I never, okay. Yeah. I never knew I had cousins in the States. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for showing the letters just to show even more oh. about the family. Yeah. It's great to see it. Yeah. There's plenty more still yet to post. We're only through about 10 years of them so far and we've got, we've got a lot more. I knew we still had family there, but didn't know names or where we would be able to find them. So it's wonderful to, to see uh, to see someone in the flesh. Oh, it's really cool to, to meet you as well, Ben. Yeah. It'd certainly be an ideal opportunity for you guys to come back to the stall next year in 2013. You'll have to come visit, see the rest right. of the family. I, I can't wait. I can't believe that. I just can't get over Joe. It's somebody that like that would be so close, related, and just never to meet him ever. Like it's just crazy. Not even to know they exist. Thanks well, very much, Tyke. Well done, boy. No, it's well, done. No, yeah. So. With the Glacier family story coming full circle, it's almost time for Tyke to head back down under. 
before he leaves, Mary Cogan has one last story for him. Another Listowel connection, this time in Tighe's own adopted home city. In the early 1800s, workhouses were built in Ireland yeah. to cater for homeless and poor people. But by the middle of the 19th century, the famine had happened and the numbers of people arriving at the doors of the workhouses far outstripped the, road, the capacity of the workhouse right. to house them. At the same time, on the other side of the world, in Australia, there was a great shortage of young women to be domestic servants. So the High Commissioner for the Colonies, his name was Earl Grey, he's the same man who gave his name to the tea. Earl Grey, yeah. He thought of a great scheme to solve the problem. He would take suitable young girls from the workhouse to Australia to be the domestic servants. What I didn't realise until I got a letter from a woman called Julie Evans in Sydney that girls went from the workhouse in Listone. I am so proud of my great-great-grandmother Bridget. She crossed the world as little more than a child, left all that was known and familiar, made a new life in a very different country and was loved and respected by her community. That's a fantastic connection. It is, it's it is. It's a yeah, fantastic yeah, connection. Yeah, yeah. I often felt in Sydney that I was lost and on my own and the people asked me when I went over as an 18-year-old so I'd felt that I was, I was there on my own, you know what I mean? If, I suppose if I knew this information, I would have went searching for it. Oh, Mary, thank you very much. You're yeah, a fantastic yeah, connection. Yeah, yeah. On his return to Sydney, Haig wastes no time in connecting with the story of Bridget Ryan as he meets up with her great-great-granddaughter, Barbara Farrell. Hello, Barbara. Hello, Tig. Nice to meet you. And likewise. How are you doing? Nice when I met her there, it was almost like an instant connection. It was just a very happy moment when I shook her hand and met her. Like, well, there's a connection here already between us. My great-great-grandmother, Bridget, came out here in 1848 on the Thomas Abuthnot with two other girls from Listowel mm -hmm. Workhouse. And this is where they came. So she had, at 13, was sent to work as a domestic. Ah. And at some stage during that time, she happened to meet a man called James Murray. He was 23, and she married him at age 14. Oh, my God. And she had her first child at 15. Oh. I do have a photo of her, and I'm assuming she would be towards her 40s there. OK. Um, and over here is James Murray, yep. her husband, husband. And she had 14 children. And 14 she lived kids. to the age of nearly 74. Oh, wow. And became a great pillar of society. She was loved by everyone. It's the story of Australia. Yeah. It just shows the strength of the people of Ireland. There's a strength that she must have got from deep down somewhere over there in Listowel, definitely. <laughs> a lot of people living in Ireland don't understand how passionate people are from around the world of their heritage and of being of Irish descent. And no more so than, than you could see with Barbara. And yes, she's born and bred an Australian, but she's extremely proud of her Irish heritage. So many descendants that are still alive today. Oh yes, hundreds. <laughs> I'm, I'm certainly going to have to put on you is to get the whole lot of them over to Ireland and over to Listowel. Oh my goodness, there's not enough room for them all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that would be a gathering. That would be a gathering. That would be a wonderful gathering. <laughs> Lovely. Look, thank you. It was great to meet you. And Look, it was wonderful. And to complete his mission to bring them back home from down under, Tig is ready to send an invitation to the Sydney Irish. We're all proud Irish people and obviously we've got a responsibility to where we come from. There's some great stuff going on all over Ireland and uh, here's just a quick snippet of of what's going on in, in, in the store in County Kerry. It's great to be back in my hometown of the store. Don't take my word for it. No one says it better than my great friend, John B. Keane. Beautiful Listowel serenaded night and day by the gentle waters of the River Field. The stall where it's easier to write than not to write. Where first love never dies. And the tall streets hide the loveliness. The heartbreak and the moods great and small. Of all the gentle souls of a great and good community. Okay, okay, okay. Sweet and comparable hometown that shaped and made me. So come back home in 2013. You will be amazed with what can happen.
know that there's a certain amount of fuss about it, I'll probably go next year without question. And in fact, maybe the family as well, actually. Mr. Gaelic football was something that I loved before I left and um, something that's still very close to my heart, so I, I do miss it. And um, One day maybe I can get, get back and, and play again. I'm going back now again at Christmas, so I'm kind of, uh, I suppose you'd be saying, one of the few lucky ones that do get back every so often. I definitely will have. I go on the water, yeah. I'm very, very proud to be an Irish man here out in Australia and, and I know the responsibility and understand the responsibility. Just because you're on the other side of the world, you can't block it away, you know. You've still got a responsibility to try and do something for the country. You've got a responsibility for the economy and where you come from and remembering your, your culture and your heritage. I've certainly got the bug of, of, of understanding my heritage and, and where I come from and, and the town that I love so much in the store.